Hi, Keith here with another in my series of short videos on using Primer and Permanova to analyse and interpret multivariate data. In this video I'm going to look at ways of looking at the relationship between a set of biological variables and a set of environmental variables. If you haven't watched the first video in the series, then do that so that you've got an idea of the scenario and the preliminary work that is done with the data. But in brief, I've got a set of eight sample sites. Two of these are directly to the south of two oil platforms which are leaking pollution which is becoming incorporated into the sediments and potentially affecting the marine organisms. There's two controls off to the side. So these are the northern sites with west and east impact and far west and far east controls. And the same situation is replicated to the south in deeper water. So this is about 50 metres deep and this is about 70 metres deep. And I'm working with a set of simulated environmental data where there's four environmental variables of interest, depth, sediment, particle size, nutrients, and levels of hydrocarbon pollution. And there's also a set of biological variables, which are abundances of species of crustacean, mollusk, and worm found in the sediments. Okay, I have both the environmental and biological data imported into Primer. Um, I've done some transformation of and normalization of the environmental data and then calculated the resemblance matrix using Euclidean distance. And I've done the square root biological data and calculated resemblance matrix using Bray Curtis. Looking at the PCA for the environmental, we can see a clear difference between the northern impact sites and their respective controls and those two groups of samples are different from the samples in the southern area. In the southern area there's still some separation between the impact and control samples but it's not as great. On the MDS of the biological it's basically the impact samples in the northern area versus the rest with separation between the west and east impact locations. Now what I'd like to do is to see what relationships there are between the biological variables, that is the abundances of the taxa, and the environmental variables, and also to see which of those environmental variables is best explaining the patterns in the biological data. Well, the first thing I can do is use a procedure called RELATE. So if I start here with the biological resemblance matrix selected, go to Analyze, Relate, and then select the resemblance matrix for the environmental data, and then hit OK. This little warning here is just saying that I don't have uh, unique labels for all my samples, but it doesn't matter. Now, let's go to the results for the Relate. So what's happening here? What Primer is doing here is it's looking at how well the relationships in the biological resemblance matrix match up to those in the environmental matrix. So how well do the patterns here match up to the patterns there? And it does it using a Spearman's rank correlation coefficient. And a value close to one indicates that the patterns are quite similar in both those two matrices. Now you can see here the value we're getting is point, close to 0.6, which is a reasonably good correlation. And the significance level is 0.1%. And that's 0.1%, not 0.1. 0.1% is much less than 5%, so that correlation is significant. The patterns in the biological resemblance matrix here are quite similar to those in the environmental resemblance matrix. Now that significance level is generated by permutating the data. So let's just go over to the graph here. What Primer is doing here is first it takes the resemblance matrices, matrices as they are and calculates the correlation. That is the dotted line here at 0.59. 
and then it simply randomizes the labels or shuffles the values around and recalculates the correlation and it does that about a thousand times and plots up a distribution of those and you can see that the values for the randomized data are much smaller than the values for the actual real matrices and that's clearly indicating that there's pattern present in the real matrices and that pattern is destroyed when we randomize the data and many of the tests in primer and permanover are done using that kind of perm permutation procedure if you don't need to see these graphs you can just turn that option off now what that does is it just tells us there's a relationship between those two matrices it doesn't tell us which environmental variables are the ones that we're actually interested in or the ones that are most important so let's go over here and select the environmental data go to um, analyze and best and it wants us to select the resemblance matrix that we want to look at now there's two ways of proceeding here bio end and bv step if there's relatively few variables, and there is here, I've only got four, I can use bioenv, which will search through all combinations. If I've got a large number of environmental variables, I might use to, need to use BV step, which will follow a stepwise approach, which will work faster. I'll turn on the permutation test. I won't bother to plot the histogram this time, and I'll hit OK. Again, get the same error message. So, Here's the results summary up the top here of what we're doing. And scroll down. Here's a list of the variables that are included. And then down here are the best correlations or best sets of correlations. So the best correlation between the biological and the individual environmental variables is if we include variables 1 and 4. That's depth and hydrocarbon. And if we do that, we get a correlation coefficient of 0.81. Again, that's highly significant. So that's telling us that the two variables which best explain or best correlated with the patterns in the communities, the biological communities, are hydrocarbon and depth. And we're not getting any real additional information by adding in sediments and nutrients. Now this is useful information, but it doesn't tell us how much of the variation we're actually explaining. So there is a different procedure. So if I start here with the uh, biological resemblance matrix and go to permanover, distal M, and select the data sheet for the environmental. Distal M is distance-based linear modeling. And what we're doing here is something similar to a multiple regression approach where we're trying to model or describe the patterns in the biota, the communities, using the environmental variables. Now there's a whole set of different ways of proceeding here. So I suggest to start with we work with all specified, R squared and do the marginal tests. So in other words go with the default to start with. Again same error message. Now so let's scroll down and see what we've got. Here are variables 1 through to 4 and first we've got the marginal test. Now the marginal test is done to test if there is a significant correlation between the biota and each of these environmental variables on its own and there is a significant correlation with depth hydrocarbons and sediment but not with nutrients now that's each on its own then the procedure works through adding in the other variables and doing further tests now it ends up down here with a model that has all four variables included and has an R squared of 
and that means that the model is explaining about 75% of the variation in the community data, which is actually quite good. If we go to the test down here, the sequential tests, each of these is done adding in that term with the others already in there. So first it adds in depth, there's nothing else in there. Depth is significant. Sediment and nutrients actually don't contribute significantly, but once we've got depth in, adding in hydrocarbons does. Now one of the problems with using R squared as the selection criteria is that R squared always increases as you add in variables. So R squared is never going to drop off, so you're always going to end up with all the variables in the model. So, but that's not necessarily going to be the most parsimonious test. So let's go back to distal M. Stepwise is the procedure I found to be most useful in getting a good set of variables, including the ones that are important, but not including all. Forward goes by starting with none in and gradually adding them in until it doesn't make any difference. Back, backwards starts with them all in and goes backwards, taking them out. And best, like the other best procedure, runs through all combinations. Best is usable if you've got a limited number of variables, but if you've got more than a few, it's going to take quite a while to run. Um, so R squared is not good for selection criteria. All of these others are ways of using a selection criteria which doesn't continually increase as you add in variables. Um, in practice, the best one may be AICC, but I recommend you look at the manual for more information on this. We've already done the marginal test, so we don't need to do those again. Um, we will do the plot. Okay, skip the error message. Now, first we'll go back and look at the results here and then look at the plot. So what happens is, first of all, it adds in hydrocarbons. That makes a significant difference. And that's where it stops. And down here we can see that the model with hydrocarbons in is explaining about 71.5% of the total variation, which is pretty good. Um, and that value is the same as the value up there. So in this case, once hydrocarbons are in, none of the other variables are making much of a difference, so it stops there. We go to the graph. When there's only one... I've just put on the labels there. When there's only one variable in the model, you get a plot like this, where the samples are plotted out on a line um, with the first axis going up this way and the bottom axis being the actual values of the variable, the single variable that's included in the model. So basically you get the sample strung out along a line and it's quite clearly separating the northern, east and west polluted sites from the others and then intermediate between the, those highly polluted sites and the control sites are the southern sites which have some pollution in them. So just using hydrocarbons on, uh, alone, we can explain a quite a large percent, about over 70% of the variation in the community structure, which is really very good. Um, the results we've looked at, however, do suggest that depth is also important. So what I can actually do is force the selection of particular variables to see what that does. So if I go in here, these are all the variables I can, can use. I'm going to put hydrocarbons in, I'm going to put depth in, and there's no evidence that the others are doing anything much, so I'll remove those. So what I've done is basically forced the procedure to use depth and hydrocarbons. If I leave variables in the middle box here, it will force those into the model and then see if these make any difference. But I'm going to simply remove them right from the start and then let it go. So what we get this time, if I again uh, pin it out, put it out and put the labels on there, 
Um, what we get now is the axis along here is accounting for 72% of the variation. That's the same as uh, in the model with just one variable in hydrocarbons. And the axis up here accounts for only a very small percentage. Let's go back to the actual text results. It'll be a bit easier to see. So now there's two variables in, one and four, which is depth and hydrocarbon, because I forced those in. The total R squared is 73, so it's gone up a little bit. And the first axis accounts for about 72%, and the sec second axis for about another 1.5%. So the first axis across here is basically hydrocarbon from highly polluted, moderately polluted, and virtually unpolluted. And the other axis going up this way, which accounts for a little bit of the variation in the structure of the community, is depth. These are all the northern samples up there, and these are all the southern samples down there. So in this case, even though that second axis only accounts for a small percentage of the data, a small percentage of the variation in the data, about 2%, I think it does add to our model because it's discriminating between the different samples in terms of depth. So I think that adds something. So this is a case where you need to use a little bit of judgment in deciding which variables can be included or should be included and which should be excluded. So what I've gone through there is three different ways of looking at relationships between the biological and the environmental. To start with, we can just do relate, which just looks directly at the two resemblance matrices. Are the patterns in this similar to the patterns in that? Or, putting it a different way, are the patterns we see there similar to the patterns we see there in the PCA? And they are fairly similar, although there's some fairly obvious differences. The next procedure we used as soon as I find where the results went to, there is the best, which runs through combinations of environmental variables to find the set of environmental variables that are best correlated with the patterns in the biology. So in other words, which set of environmental variables are best correlated with the patterns we see here. The limitation of that is we get an idea of the correlation but we don't get an idea of how much variation in, in the biota is explained. And that's where the distal M comes in. It allows us to actually model the variation in the communities using the environmental variables we have. And we can get a selection of environmental variables which best explain the biota. And all of these three methods eventually lead us to the same conclusion that the predominant influence in this system, not surprisingly, is the hydrocarbon pollution, but there's also a depth-related pattern. Um, and that could be due to one of the other environmental variables, either sediments or nutrients, but we can't work that out any further with the data we have.